my talk. Uh, I'm Dominic Chell, one of the, uh, the red teamers from MDSEC. Um, so my talk today is um, how I met your beacons. Ah, excellent, that worked. It took, I had to get some guy on Fiverr to make that for me. Um, so, um, so today I'm, we'll be more focused on the blue side really. Um, so I'm going to be looking at some effective strategies for detecting beacons on Windows. Um, including detections for behavior, um, in-memory analysis, network interaction, um, that kind of stuff. I guess my interest in this topic is really threefold. Um, so firstly, it's no secret that we've got some skin in the game um, because we you know, produce a framework ourselves. Um, so I'm interested in this kind of stuff because obviously I want to improve our tooling. Secondly, um, from a red team perspective, um, I'm interested in it because I want to improve craft and make sure that we avoid doing certain actions that might end up kind of leaving dangling IOCs behind. And then finally, um, yeah, I do get involved with threat hunting exercises, that kind of stuff at MDSEC, so it is useful for me to have a good understanding on how to kind of spot beacons. Um, I guess I've always been in the mindset, um, yeah, in order to hide, you kind of really need to understand all the different ways that you can be found. Um, I'll also kind of demo a tool that I've been working on that we're going to open source called Beacon Hunter, um, which implements some of the strategies that I'm going to talk about today. And then we'll look at some real world examples um, from some uh, popular C2 frameworks. So the C2 frameworks that we're going to focus on is probably going to make Gene sweat a little bit over there. Uh, the first one will be Cobalt Strike. Um, I'm sure everybody's you know, kind of familiar with this, doesn't really need any introduction. Um, you know, it's as popular with red teams as it is with threat actors. Um, so having kind of an understanding on how to detect Cobalt Strike is really beneficial for defenders. Um, I guess like one of the great things about Cobalt though, um, at least from the red team perspective, is that it's, you know, it's, it's highly customizable. So um, there's a lot of flexibility for the operator to, to kind of mix up how it behaves. Um, that can make um, pinning down generic detections quite tricky. Um, so all the analysis that we did was on um, Cobalt Strike 4.6.1, which is the latest version. The other C2 framework that we're going to talk about will be Brute Retail. Um, this is another commercial framework developed by a company called Dart Vortex. Um, it's a little bit less popular, but it seems to be growing um, in popularity amongst threat actors at least. Um, Unit 42 um, dropped a blog post recently talking about how it was being abused by APT29. And then I think maybe last week or the week before, um, Sophos dropped a blog post uh, documenting on how the Black Hat ransomware group were using it. Um, I guess um, they kind of like stole some of my content actually because I wrote this talk a while ago and then people started like focusing on it and, and blogging about some of the stuff that I'd already knew about. But hopefully, you know, a few things will still be quite unique. Um, one of the interesting things, I guess, about um, detections for Brute Retail is that the agent is not particularly customizable. So um, outside of the C2, you can't really change how it behaves. Um, so for example, there's no real way to kind of customize the obfuscate and sleep strategies um, or its loading process, that kind of stuff. So if you start to build detections for it, they can be quite powerful. Um, and then, you know, I saw this image on, uh, on Twitter, I think it was like VX Underground put it up there, and they, you can see they've gone to the effort of obscuring all this kind of stuff, but you probably can't see it, it's not too clear, but there's actually an IP address in there that's not been obfuscated, uh, and I just randomly who is it, and it pointed to Moscow, so um, it kind of gives you an indication of who might be using this framework. Um, all the analysis that we did was on the latest version, uh, which was 107 as of today. So... And let's start from the beginning and look at how a beacon might actually begin its life. Um, so firstly, there'd be some kind of loader. That loader's probably got an encrypted copy of the beacon inside it. Um, the loader then will probably perform some kind of process injection, um, maybe to a remote process, maybe in a local thread. Um, then the shell code will probably unpack itself and, and it will then go on to load any dependencies that are required by the beacon. Um, and then the reflective loader will be executing, the reflective DLL will be executing in memory, doing its, all its C2 from a thread. And that's a pretty standard way for a beacon to kind of initialize itself and, and kind of get itself running in memory. Um, and what we're going to look at is um, you know, kind of like through each step of this, this process. Oh, what is going on here? Through each step of this process, where's my thing? Yeah, for each one of these steps, we're going to look at basically um, different IOCs that can kind of trigger uh, and where we can build detections around them. 
So the first one that I'm going to focus on um, is behavior. Um, and I think behavior is quite interesting, um, particularly when you look at um, commercial products, because you can't necessarily change the behavior if it's a behavior that is built into the architecture of the Okay, that's back. <laughs> Having some technical difficulties today. Um, so some good examples of behaviors that we might be interested in um, that could leave dangling IOCs um, are things like image loads, things like name pipes. They might not necessarily be um, customizable by the operator. So let's look at image loads to start off with. Um, I guess, so in order for a beacon to kind of remain small, I'm going to change this. It's just not working. It's not working great. Okay, that's better. <laughs> um, so in order for the beacon to remain small, it usually relies on functionality from the operating system um, using DLL dependencies. So for example, rather than building your own HTTP client, it kind of makes much more sense to use something like WinHttp or WinINet. Um, now, when the beacon loads these DLLs, we can obviously capture uh, this telemetry if we're um, you know, collecting image load events. Um, so for example here, we can see we're capturing our notepad loading, loading kernel base um, .dll um, with sysmon event 7. Um, so image load telemetry is kind of interesting for us because it gives us hunting opportunities. Um, so some of the things that we can focus on are um, you know, Beacon Framework's loading all its dependencies on, at the start. Um, we can start to build signatures on that. Um, if we're hunting for egress beacons, um, we can see that they'll typically load things like WinHttp or WinINet. And if we kind of create baselines of um, DLL loads from specific processes, um, we can look for anomalies. So for example, if we saw something like um, Notepad loading dbg help, that would probably be irregular. Um, so how do we go about hunting for these kind of things? Um, well, usually most EDRs have this built into them. You can, you can uh, build like hunt rules uh, within your EDR. Um, but for, for my examples, I'm just going to use Elastic. Um, so if you're not familiar um, with e EQL, it's basically a SQL-like language that Elastic provides you. It allows you to query the event database. Um, so in this example, all I'm basically saying is um, Give me all the processes that have loaded um, credui.dll, winhttp.dll within the space of a minute. And we can just pump that into our events database and, and find all those processes. So let's look at a real example. So I took Brute Retail um, and I injected it into Notepad um, using the built-in PC inject command. Uh, and then I just watched for DLL loads. And as you can see, when the reflective loader executes, um, it loads all the dependencies for the DLL, uh, for, for the reflective DLL. And there's quite a lot of stuff in there. It kind of pretty much loads the kitchen sink. Um, so, and there's some quite unique stuff that you wouldn't necessarily expect to see in all processes. So for example, um, you, you know, we can see cred UI here, which is probably um, wherever it is. Um, it's probably down to his you know, credential prompt phishing thing tool that he's got built into the, the C2. Um, so what can we do with this? Um, well, using EQL, we can trivially um, build um, you know, signatures to detect brute retail when it's loading and when it's injected into beacons. So for example, if we took this EQL rule, we're basically saying, give me all the processes where CredUI, DBG help, and WinHttp are all loaded within the space of a minute. Um, and as we can see here, I just pumped it into my events database, and I was able to trivially find all the um, injected notepad processes. And this is cool because we can use this um, retrospectively, so we can actually hunt for all injections that have occurred in our environment over time, assuming we've got the telemetry. So let's like look at in-memory stuff. Um, so once the beacon's injected, it will typically remain memory resident, really to avoid any on-disk detections. Um, the beacon, as I mentioned before, is usually injected into memory using a loader, which will like, create a thread or hijack a thread. Um, and then it will typically be operating from virtual memory or from a stomped module. Um, so there's various kind of like things that we can look at um, for in-memory detections. The first one is probably the most straightforward and the most simple but is also possibly one of the most effective for detecting known malware, which is using pre-built signatures. 
Essentially, this involves um, scanning memory with a tool, something like Yara or through your EDR, for known signatures of a beacon. These could be like strings that might be in the reflective DLL, or they could be specific opcodes from the text section of the implant. So if you've not played with Yara before, it's pretty straightforward. Um, a simple Yara rule, probably the most simple Yara rule might look something like this. All we're basically saying is um, scan this process memory, um, and if you spot two of these strings that are in blue, this Hello um, Zeefcon 2022, if you spot two of those, um, then, then tell me about it. So let's look um, at how this might apply to Cobalt Strike. So Cobalt Strike has got some evasion configurations built into it for avoiding in-memory detections. So the first one is the strorep malleable config option. Um, this basically allows the operator to replace strings that might exist within the beacon's reflective DLL with whatever they want. Um, now, I think in-memory detections are probably a bit of a problem for Cobalt Strike at the moment because of its popularity, um, and it's gained much more focus from EDR and AV companies. Um, so what they did was in the 4.4 release, they basically introduced a, um, something called the sleep mask kit which effectively allows the operator to provide their own custom code for sleeping and obfuscating the beacon in memory. So there's three kind of configurations that you can go with for this um, for sleep masking. Obviously, there's no sleep mask. Um, in this kind of scenario, the strings, the code, it'll all remain in plain text, um, and the beacon can trivially be picked out of memory through memory scanning. We can enable sneak, uh, the sleep mask with sleep mask equals true in the malleable profile. Um, so when this is turned on, um, basically, it will, Cobalt Strike will mask the beacon in memory. Um, it will use XOR to obfuscate the strings and data. Um, and, but this can still be fingerprinted because it's basically using like a, a pre-built um, pre pre obfuscate and sleep strategy. Um, and you can, you can build your rules for it on the, uh, on, the, on the actual code that does the sleeping. Um, and then finally, which is probably the preferred option, um, you've got the user-defined sleep mask. Um, and this basically exposes the sleep mask functionality to the operator. Um, it provides them with pointers to um, beacon's heap memory, um, and it basically allows you to kind of walk through it and obfuscate the text section and obfuscate all the heat records for the beacon, which is pretty cool. Um, so if we look at how this actually works, um, so using the user-defined sleep mask, and there are a couple of things that you need to be aware of, a couple of trade-offs. Um, so notably, um, if you're operating from um, kind of read execute memory only, then it, the beacon doesn't actually obfuscate the text section because it can't write to it. So um, in essence, it's not actually adding anything. Um, so you can still build, build your rules for the text section of the beacon. Um, so you can see in this example, uh, we've got like use RWX equals false, uh, and we're still able to pick up Cobalt Strike um, with, with a YAR rule. Um, and that, as I said, that's basically because the text section is not modifiable. If we, um, if we wanted to obfuscate the text section, um, we can do that. Um, but I guess the trade-off is we have to operate from um, read, write, execute memory. Um, so I think it's probably a case of, you know, pick your poison. What do you think is the bigger IOC? How about Brute Retail? Does that fare any better? Um, so if we took a look at the documentation for Brute Retail, um, it basically says something along the lines of it's got a pretty complex sleep and obfuscate mechanism. Um, it uses a mixture of uh, Windows event creation, weight objects, timers, in addition to kind of ROP gadgets and APCs. So you would think it would be pretty complex to detect the beacon, right? Um, so what we did was uh, we injected a badger, as he calls it, to um, a process, put the badger to sleep uh, on quite a high sleep, and then just did a strings dump over the, um, all the strings that were in memory. And I was a little bit surprised to see some stuff like this sitting around. Um, so as I say, all I did was use process hacker and dumped the strings. And we can see randomly there's things like AMSI, ETW, patched, that kind of stuff. I mean, it sounds totally legit. Um, and uh, basically, that was because the, the obfuscate and sleep mechanism is only, only protecting the text section. Um, so what I did was I was kind of curious about how this was working. So I wanted to reverse engineer it. Um, so I threw it into IDA. Um, and I wanted to kind of start to build some, some more reliable detections. Um, 
so when I threw it into IDA, um, one of the, the things that I kind of spotted initially was um, Brute Loader. That's basically the export for the, the entry point for the reflective DLL. Um, so I searched memory for um, the string Brute Loader, uh, and we spotted it inside the Sleeping Badger. Um, so what can we do with this? Well, we can build a very simple YAR rule um, to search for all instances of Brute Retell that might be running in any process in memory and pluck them out quite trivially. Um, but can we take this one step further? Uh, we can. So I plugged it into VirusTotal, um, and we can find all the other samples of um, Brute Retell that are sitting around in there and pull them down um, and have a look what they're doing as well. Uh, and I'll come back to this because actually what we did was um, we wrote a tool to extract all the configurations from the artifacts on disk and from the artifacts in memory. Um, so you can get all the C2 information, all that kind of stuff. Um, so kind of moving on from signatures, um, what else can we use to spot the beacon? Um, well, once the beacon's up and running um, in memory, it'll typically operate from, as I said, virtual memory or from like a stomp DLL. If it's operating from virtual memory, there's a few kind of like telltale indicators um, that we can use or we can focus on to build detections. Um, so perhaps one of the most obvious things is, is the page permissions, as I kind of touched on with, um, with Cobalt Strike already. Um, so outside of the, the CLR, outside of um, CLR JIT, it, it's pretty irregular to see um, executable pages that are not, not backed by a DLL. So if we saw something like um, this where we've got uh, the read execute uh, page permission set and it's not um, backed against an, a physical DLL on disk, then it's probably a little bit suspicious. Um, so if we can start to hunt for these, um, and uh, you know, if we kind of maybe disregard the CLR modules for a moment, um, you know, we, we can start to build kind of relatively high signal detections around them. Um, obviously, there are um, there are ways around this. Um, so some beacons have strategies built into them um, within their obfuscate and sleep to um, basically modify the page permissions. Um, so basically, when the beacon goes to sleep, it removes the execute bit from that page. And these strategies, they typically leverage um, some form of event-driven execution um, within its sleep and wake. Um, and when it re-engages um, execution, it'll use something like ROP gadgets to call um, virtual protect and reset the, the beacon's page permissions back to executable. Um, so there is like some um, you know, blog posts out there detailing some of the techniques that we, dis that we discovered and we're using in, in our product. Um, one of my colleagues, Peter Wintersmith, um, built um, a technique that uses um, Windows uh, timers. Um, and this technique basically works by queuing a number of timers using queue timer, queue, uh, create timer, queue timer, um, which then when it triggers, um, ends up returning to some previously de defined um, context records, which um, call NT continue and end up calling virtual protect acting like a form of ROP to engage the um, execute bit back on the page. So it might look something like this, where when the beacon's awake, you know, it's doing its tasking and the, um, the execute bit is set on that page. Um, and then when the beacon goes to sleep, it might be reset back to um, read-write. So how does this work within Cobalt Strike? Um, the, well, the page permissions are always executable in Cobalt Strike. It doesn't have a strategy to, um, to remove them on, on sleep. Um, so the page permissions will typically remain um, read-execute or read-write-execute. And without module stomping, um, this will always um, you know, run from virtual memory, won't have a DLL backed against it. So that's it's pretty straightforward to pick up. Brute Retail does have um, a obfuscate and sleep strategy that modifies the page permissions. So you can see here it's um, read execute, um, and then when the beacon's asleep, it's, um, it's read write. Um, so I was kind of like curious um, to see, you know, kind of how this works. And one of the interesting things about this strategy within Brute Retell is, you know, it's, it's kind of cool that it's like flipping the page permissions because it does make it harder to set when it's sleeping. That is unless you've got a badger linked to peer-to-peer -to -peer, um, because obviously those two need to communicate. So if you've got a pivot enabled within Brute Retell, um, you know, all bets are off. It just doesn't uh, encrypt itself and it remains executable all the time. So if you've got a egress beacon linked to a peer-to-peer -peer beacon, there's no obfuscate and sleep. Um, so I was kind of like curious again at how this um, at how this worked. So what I did was um, while I was reversing Brute Retell, um, I had a look at the obfuscate and sleep inside IDA, um, and 
I guess like basically the way it works is, or, or what it does, the first thing it does is it creates a new thread um, and it spoofs the start address of that thread to be TP release um, cleanup group members plus 55 hex. Um, and then once it creates that thread, it um, sets up a number of context structures. Um, so these context structures are basically used to call things like um, NT wait for single object to delay execution, um, NT protect virtual memory to change page permission, system function uh, 32 to you know, do RC4, that kind of stuff. Um, and these are basically the different steps within its, um, its encrypt, uh, obfuscate, and sleep strategy. Um, and then once it's set up the context structures, it basically queues a bunch of APCs against NT continue, um, and these will end up proxying calls um, to those context structures, as I kind of mentioned. Um, so by the time I'd kind of like put a couple of hours into, into reversing this, um, it kind of like clicked on me. Um, I've seen this before. Um, and it basically, it's just the, um, the open source implementation of foliage uh, that Austin Hudson's got on his um, GitHub repo. Um, I, like, interestingly, you know, based on the description about the timers and all that kind of like stuff that was in the blog post, I was expecting to see a little bit more, but um, actually I couldn't find any imports for any of the timer APIs or anything like that. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe I missed something. Um, so moving on, um, there are other kind of like in-memory IOCs that can, can be left around, dangling around, that threat hunters can use to build detections. Um, so these might be deployed by the operator, they might be deployed by the beacon. Um, so some good examples of these are um, patches, like memory hooks. Um, so things that might be um, applied to things like ETW or AMSI, um, you know, maybe to disable telemetry or to evade scanning from antivirus engines. Um, so hunting for these can give us a really high signal um, that something suspicious is going on inside a beacon. Um, so in this example, um, these are taken from um, the Sliver Armory. Um, so basically, patching ETW, you can see all it's doing is finding the address of ET, um, ETW Eventwrite, uh, and it's patching it with a RET. Um, and then we've got an AMSI scan buffer bypass down here. Um, so if we can actually hunt for these in processes, we um, looking for these patches, then we know that there's something suspicious going on. Um, the only kind of like problem with this, of course, is that some of those patches might be reverted. So they could be temporary. So for example, maybe you've got like a CLR harness that's used to run an assembly in memory. Um, you might patch ETW and AMSI, do the post-exploitation um, assembly execution, and then remove those patches. So um, hunting for the patches alone is not necessarily um, the best thing to do. Um, but there are some kind of like dangling IOCs that um, do get left around. Um, so the way Windows works is it will back common DLLs to physical memory, um, and these are shared across different processes on the host. Now, if a beacon patches um, a DLL, something like NTDLL, NT um, in our previous example, like ETW, um, that triggers what's known as a copy on write operation. So that basically means that that, D the, that process gets its own copy of the DLL, and that page gets marked as private. And when the page gets marked as private, um, it basically clears a specific bit known as the shared bit on that page. So what we can do is we can hunt for processes and hunt for pages with the shared bit cleared, and then we can resolve all the exports in those pages, and we can get a good indicator um, if something has been, um, has been hooked on, the, on that page. So if we took a look at an example of this from, from Brute Retail, um, so Brute Retail's got a shop in line um, command, um, and you can see here uh, when we run shop in line with an assembly, um, it, it says on the console, you know, patch DTW event right and patch AMSI. Uh, now these patches are permanent. So what I did was um, I just ran shop in line, let it run the assembly, and then I attached WinDBG to the process, um, and I just um, disassembled um, ETW event right and AMSI scan buffer. And you can see even after the assembly's um, finished executing, the the function remains patched. So if we're threat hunting, the, we can trivially detect brute retell. Um, um, based on some of the post-exploitation actions of the operator when they're running CLR uh, assemblies by looking for these patches. Um, in addition to this, um, threads can give us a, a relatively kind of good hunting opportunity as well. So threads, as I kind of mentioned before, will typically um, be operating from virtual memory or from, from Stomp DLL. Um, there may be one or more threads, depending on whether the beacon is synchronous or asynchronous. Um, so looking for anomalies in these threads um, can be extremely useful to us. 
Um, so you can see in this example, we've got uh, we've got Cobalt Strike. Um, um, we, can, we can tell it's like one of the Cobalt Strike threads because it just it just looks entirely suspicious. Um, so we've got this kind of like null start address. And then if we look at the call stack for the thread, we can see there's a bunch of calls to virtual memory. Um, but kind of like what else, what else can we look for? Um, well, at some point when the beacon goes to sleep, it, it needs to delay execution. It needs to wait. So um, if we examine the call stack of different threads um, and we see um, some of the functions that are typically used to delay execution, so things like sleepx, and sleepx ends up calling the NT API NT, de NT delay execution. If we hunt for these threads and we combine them with other IOCs like the virtual memory, um, then you know, that's a pretty good indicator that this is a sleeping beacon. Obviously, there are kind of like ways to kind of get around this, um, and, you know, to kind of mask these suspicious calls uh, within your call stack, um, and it seems to be quite a popular thing at the moment. So some of the techniques are um, to kind of like uh, spoof the call stack. Um, there's a few different ways we can do this. Um, so we can, can could truncate the stack. Um, so basically, we end it before some of these suspicious calls. And this is pretty easy to do. Um, you can basically just um, set the return address of the frame that you, where you want to end to null, um, and that will effectively um, kind of mask that stack for us or end it early. <clears throat> Another approach uh, might be to actually clone the context of a legitimate thread. Um, so we can find a, a legitimate thread that is running in the process. Um, and then when the beacon goes to sleep, we copy the context of it um, and we overwrite our own context with it. And then we update the TIB to make sure that the TIB values match for, for that thread. That's pretty effective. Um, or another approach, this is the one that's used by um, Cobalt Strike, um, is to switch the thread to a fiber. Um, so when the beacon goes to sleep, it changes its, it changes to a fiber, um, calling create fiber X, um, and that effectively creates a new stack. Um, so what you actually look at when you re retrieve the stack is is the stack for the fiber rather than the thread, and it looks a lot um, less suspicious because it hides the kind of calls to virtual memory. So uh, they might look something like this. So the first one up here is uh, is brute retell. Um, now, the, the bits I've highlighted um, are the bits of, that are suspicious. So we can see the start address um, of the boot retail thread is um, TP release clean up group members plus 5550 hex. Um, now, every boot retail thread gets this as a start address. And this is not a common start address. Like I, I scanned my host and I couldn't find any other processes other than boot retail ones that are using this as a start address. I'm not sure why, why this one was picked, but it becomes quite a trivial um, way to actually pluck these beacons out of memory. If we looked at the call stack for it, we can see we've got some um, calls to delay execution. And then at the end, we've got this NT terminate job object. Now that is actually just a ROP gadget. Um, so if, if, if you look at this in um, WinDBG, you can actually see it's a ROP gadget for NT test alert. And he basically just uses it to make the, um, the, the uh, to, to execute the APCs that are queued on the thread. Um, if we look at Cobalt Strikes, um, thread stack spoofing, and this is quite a new thing. Um, it's only actually available like in the artifact kit, um, which was kind of quite surprising. So only the, um, the DLL and the XE artifacts that you produce um, are able to spoof the call stack. It doesn't work for shellcode or the reflective DLL. Um, so if you are, I don't know, don't know who uses the, 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 the artifacts, but if you do, then you, you can spoof the call stack. Um, and it might look something like this. And again, um, I think that's a, I think it still looks a bit suspicious because um, I, I'm not sure how uh, popular fibers actually are. Um, but we can we can spot the fiber just by the call to RTL user fiber start as the um, the first in the first frame in the call stack. Um, so like some suspicious indicators um, for stack spoofing um, that we can use to kind of build hunt, hunt rules. Um, so I guess, um, firstly, um, at least in most of the threads that I've looked at, um, they tend to have a common start address. So if the start address of the, um, the thread is RTL user thread start, uh, is, sorry, is not RTL user thread start and the second frame is not base um, thread init funk, then it's possibly that the call, the call stack has been truncated in some way. Um, in terms of like looking for clone contexts, um, what we can do is recover the TIB for each thread um, and um, we just look for duplicated values. So if we saw something like um, stack base and stack limit attributes um, that had 
uh, within the TIB that are duplicated across different threads, then um, that's probably irregular and it means that that thread has been spoofed or cloned in some way. Um, and then finally, kind of, as I mentioned, it's not, not too common to see fibers um, anymore. So scanning my own system, I didn't, didn't find any examples of them. Uh, but basically, we could potentially build um, hunt rules looking for, um, for fibers. So things with th thread stacks with a start address of RTL, user fiber start. Um, so one, one kind of approach for avoiding um, threads running from virtual memory is to use module stomping. So this te technique um, basically involves loading a legitimate module and then we stomp a comp copy of the beacon over it, um, either over the text section or over the whole DLL itself. A thread is then created that is backed by the module. So we can see in this example um, for Cobalt Strike, uh, we're using like NetShell as, um, as our stomp DLL. And then if we look in the call stack, we can see uh, like the, th the thread coming from NetShell. So there's a few different like approaches for detecting module stomping. We've got a few different options. Um, so firstly, the most simple one is probably comparing a copy of the, the module that's in memory with one that's on disk. Um, um, but I, th I don't think this is particularly feasible to do at scale because um, it kind of means reading a copy of every single DLL. So it can be quite resource intensive. Um, another option might be to look at the modified working set. So as I mentioned before, we, look, we basically hunt for these copy on write operations and we can tell, tell that, that DLL has been modified because it doesn't have the, um, the shared bit set. Um, or we can look for indicators that might actually be associated with that specific module stomping technique. So if we look at how Cobalt Strike implements its module stomping, um, we'll find it does leave some dangling IOCs within the PEB. Um, so the way the Cobalt Strike module stomping works is um, it will uh, effectively um, load a new DLL with load library X um, with these arguments, so null and do not resolve DLL references. Um, and that all that is doing is basically telling the loader um, not to call the entry point and not to resolve any uh, the import table for, for the DLL because we don't want to um, load all the DLL's dependencies. Um, so this ends up leaving like um, some IOCs in the pair, as I kind of mentioned. Um, so there's a, there's a structure, which is this LDR data table entry structure. Uh, and if we look at that, what we'll see is the entry point uh, attribute will be null um, and the image bit will be set to false. And that will basically is a good strong indicator that that module has been stomped using Cobalt Strikes and module stomping technique. How about like um, kind of moving away from the endpoint? How about um, like network level detections? Because if we're actually able to fingerprint the C2 server, then that might give us sufficient intelligence to detect beaconing coming from the network. Um, so some of the things that we might be interested in are you know, any, any kind of bugs that might be in the, the C2 server that might allow us to um, fingerprint it. So Fox it, um, Fox IT did some good research on this a couple of years ago, um, and they did a census and found a bunch of Cobalt Strike servers that were on the internet based on the response containing an extra space at the end. Um, if we can hunt for staging URIs, you know, we can pull down the beacons as well because they're, they're in a predictable format. Um, or otherwise, you know, any kind of like default content that might be exposed. So things like the default landing page or default SSL certs that are exposed by the C2 servers. We can use these to hunt for the, the C2 infrastructure. So let's look at some examples. So Cobalt Strike. Um, so Cobalt Strike is um, based on Nano HTTPD. Um, and Nano HTTP is um, basically an open source like Java web server. Um, I think like I think it was built by some university student. Um, now, one of the things that in, in the, the Fox it, Fox IT census, um, they basically showed that there was probably more Cobalt Strike servers on the internet than there were Nano HTTP servers. Um, so if you do find one of these, there's probably a good chance it's Cobalt. Um, so let's look at some ways to kind of fingerprint this. So the first one is in the range header. Um, so if you send a request um, with a range header um, where you've got bytes equals and then you've got an, in, an invalid um, integer as, as one of the values, um, you get no response back from the, from the team server. So you can use this to kind of like fingerprint for scan for Cobalt Strike, right? So I built a nuclei template to scan the internet for these, this stuff. Um, now, you might wonder, like, why do we get no response? Um, well, if we look on the, um, the team server, the reason we get no response is because we get an unhandled exception in the team server and it crashes the thread. Um, so you get something printed like this, which basically says, um, you know, invalid like, number format. Um, so if we, we want to dig deeper and see what's going on here, we can jump into the source code. Um, 
And we can see basically what it's doing when it's processing the range header um, is it's trying to um, convert the string read from, from the header into an integer. Um, and there's no exception handling around this. Um, so when you send an invalid, um, an invalid integer, it ends up throwing this unhandled exception. Um, other ways we can fingerprint Cobalt Strike again with the range header. So um, this, this, this IOC is shared with Nano HTTPD. Um, but we can figure out whether it's Cobalt Strike or Nano HTTPD um, based on the server header, because if this, you don't expect IES and Apache to behave like this, returning these responses. So basically, if you send a range um, like from byte one to zero, if you're asking for the, the content in byte one to zero, that's a range that the server can't, can't um, facilitate. So it ends up providing this um, fixed response of range not satisfied. Um, so again, we can scan the internet for these and, and use it to pluck out Cobalt Strike servers. Another fingerprint within the, um, the Cobalt Strike team server is, um, is when we send an invalid byte. Um, so what I, spot, I spotted this in the source code, and we get this like fixed response. Um, so if you send um, an invalid URL encoded um, byte, so percent zero, like obviously it needs to be two bytes for it to be, to be a valid byte, um, we end up getting a fixed response back. Um, which is this uh, bad percent encoding. So again, we can use this to, to, scan, to scan for Cobalt Strike. Um, how about Brute Retail? Um, so we can fingerprint the Brute Retail C2 server. Um, so if you send a post request um, with some Base64, um, valid Base64, but the Base64 does not um, unpack to the C2 traffic, um, again, that triggers triggers um, a unhandled exception and you get no response back from the, from the team server. So again, we can use this to, um, to scan for Brute Retail servers. Now, I'm pretty confident people are scanning for Brute Retail servers because um, I had got a Brute Retail server um, sitting in AWS and then I wasn't actually using it at the time, um, but I got a takedown notice from, um, from Amazon. Um, and I, at first, I thought it was like one of our red team gigs and you know, someone had been busted. Um, and then when I took a look at the instance ID, it was basically the, the test Brute Retail instance that we got. So I think you know, some internet hero is um, like scanning the internet and reporting all the Brute Retail instances. Um, now, these are pretty trivial to pick up with um, like Shodan, so if the default landing page is exposed, um, we can basically just take the hash for it, pump it into Shodan, uh, and find out where some of these are. Uh, and we can see you know, there's a few of them out there, like the, the majority of them seem to be in the US. There's a couple in Russia. I don't know what they might be. Um, and then I saw this tweet from this guy um, was basically saying, you know, R Russians obviously, you know, they don't discriminate against any specific C2. They, they like to host both Cobalt Strike and Brute Retail on their infrastructure. Um, so once we found, uh, once we found one of these, um, you know, we found a badger, you know, what can we do with it? Um, so as I kind of mentioned before, um, we built a little tool to um, scan artifacts, um, so DLLs, XEs that have got Brute Retail in them and extract all the configuration information um, so we can get the C2 URIs, we can get the secrets for the, the, the team server, um, that kind of stuff. Um, we can also scan these in memory, so you can see I'm just giving a PID here, uh, and basically it's like like looking for the, the badger's config structure in memory, and then when it finds it, it just prints it out. So we can, we can actually uh, extract all these from any kind of processes too. So I guess, you know, we put all this together, like what, what can we do with it? Like what was the point of all this research? Um, well, what I did was um, I basically used it to, to build a tool um, that I called um, Beacon Hunter which I'm going to open source. There's also like a whole bunch of blog posts. I think we've got like four or five blog posts. We did look at like other C2s, um, but like when I was putting this together for the presentation, I just had way too much material. So I just picked the two that were probably the most popular. Um, but some of the things that the Beacon Hunter will currently do is it will look for things like, um, it will analyze call stacks. It'll look for um, beacons that are running in unmapped memory, uh, look for suspicious start addresses, it will um, look for suspicious execute pages, um, it will detect Cobalt Strikes module stomping, it will detect in-memory hooks even if they've been reverted, that kind of stuff. So let me give you a quick demo of this. Um, now I have cheated and I have recorded the demo so it cannot go wrong. I've given talks before so you know this is the, the safest way to operate. Um, okay, so we're going to start off with Brute Retail. 
So basically, I've got Brute Retail here, uh, and I've injected it into Notepad. Uh, and what we're going to take a look at is, now you might not have seen that, but the start address of this, this thread, this uh, thread, is it was null. Uh, and if we took a look at the call stack for it, we can see it's got a wait for single object. Um, so it's, it's just a thread that's delaying execution. Um, and then if we take a look at the next thread, uh, what we can do, I'm just going to pause that. We can tell this is brute retail, and I might not necessarily be clear, but the start address of this one is um, TP release cleanup group members plus um, 550 hex. Whereas all the other ones you can see are 450 hex, so that one's 550 hex. So we know immediately that that one's brute retail. And then if we took a look at the call stack for it, um, we can see, as I kind of mentioned before, we've got the um, the calls to delay execution, and then at the end, we've got the, the ROP gadget for NT test alert to execute the APCs that are queued on the thread. Now, um, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm just going to run um, Beacon Hunter over this PID. Um, so I'm just going to pause this. Um, so all we're doing is I'm telling it to um, it supports filters, so you can say, you know, scan for all processes that have got winhttp.dll loaded. Uh, and I'm giving it a PID just so I don't have to scan all of them. Um, and I'm basically saying, um, so M is for memory, T is for threads, um, H, uh, I can't remember, uh, P is for page permissions. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to scan uh, this brute retail process. Uh, I'm just going to pause. I, just, I think I highlight them. Um, so some of the stuff that we pick up, um, or b the Beacon Hunter picks up, is we've got the suspicious um, start address, and then it, it tells us that it's brute retail um, because we know it's brute retail because brute retail is the only thing that has that that fixed start address. So we found both of the brute retail threads. Um, so thread ID 10236, thread ID. 2900, uh, and uh, we know that that one is brute retail as well, and we can see that they're delaying execution because we've got the call to wait for single object. Um, so that's the, the first one. I'm going to have to speed up because he's telling me I've only got five minutes. Um, what I'm going to do next is... Um, show you how we can detect the memory hooks. Um, so what I'll do is uh, I'm just going to run sharp in line in brute retail. Uh, and just run any old assembly. I think I'll run seatbelt. Now, if you remember when I was talking, I said that um, the, in, the sharp in line command basically does leave these dangling IOCs, so it patches um, ETW and it patches AMSI scan buffer and it leaves them sitting in memory. So we're going to run seatbelt. And then uh, if we run uh, beacon hunter over the process, So same thing again, same process. Um, but what we get this time is um, it actually tells us that um, there's a bunch of hooks that have been applied. Now, this is not looking for the opcodes on the hooks. It's basically doing it by um, looking if the shared bit has um, been cleared on those pages, and then it resolves all the exports in those pages. So we don't know exactly which um, function has been hooked, but all the exports that are on that page might have been. So we can see it's probably ETW event write, and we can see here on this page that it's probably the, um, the AMSI scan buffer. Um, so again, that, that gives us a good way to detect these hooks in memory. The next one I'm going to do is, um, is Cobalt Strike. So I've got a couple of beacons here, um, both injected into Notepad. And one of them is using module stomping, and one of them is running from virtual memory. So I think I'll look at the virtual memory one first. Let's find the PID. So if we took a look at this one here, let's pause it for a second. Um, we can see that the um, basically in this thread, we've got a call. That in the stack of the thread, we've got a call from virtual memory. And we can see it's calling sleepx and then NT delay execution. So we know that is um, a pretty good candidate for being a sleeping beacon. Um, so I'll just run uh, Beacon Hunter over this one as well. 
I did mess up here. I gave it the, I tried to cut it out, but I gave it the wrong uh, PID initially. Um, so if we scan it with um, Beacon Hunter, we can see some of the stuff it's picked up. Um, so it's picked up the sleeping beacon. It's telling me it's got calls to um, SleepX and NT delay execution in the stack. Um, it's basically telling me uh, that it's running from unmapped, an unmapped image. Um, and we can see the suspicious looking like start address of null. So again, those are pretty good um, IOCs to, uh, to flag that something suspicious is going on in this process. Um, the next one we're going to look at is uh, the module stomped one. Um, so just to prove it's module stomping, um, we will uh, have a look at the call stack for this one. And you can see we're stomping from uh, WW, I don't know, whatever that deal I was. Uh, and then I'm just going to run Beacon Hunter over it again. Uh, and what we should see is um, it picks up the same stuff with the threads, but um, like down here, you can see it basically says checking for module stomping and it says found stomp DLL. And that is, um, it's able to detect cobalt strikes and module stomping functionality basically down to um, the specific DLL that's been stomped because of those dangling IOCs that get left in the pub. Cool. All right. Where's my mouse? Okay, not too much more. That, that, that's pretty much it, really. Um, but just a quick thank you to um, some of the other guys from MDSEC, um, particularly Peter, who gave me lots of advice when like doing some of this stuff, gave me some example code and things to look at. Um, and also uh, Mod EXP, uh, who helped me with some of the reverse and abrupt result. There's a bunch of like really good uh, like references um, here to different techniques, um, both for detection and for building um, you know evasion strategies, um, which I would kind of like recommend going and reading.